Hello and welcome to Core Finance. I'm Matt Brown. I'm joined today by Simon Watkins, who is a financial journalist and author and a trader. Long business card, <laughs> but uh, very important for our viewers. So first off, Simon, thank you so much for coming into our studio today. Thanks for inviting me in. Absolute pleasure. Now, mm -hmm. let's start off. Um, Black Monday. Mm. We're coming up to the 30th anniversary of Black Monday, um, which is on the 19th of October. And for a few of our viewers who may not have been around um, when um, this event occurred, uh, or maybe haven't read it in textbooks, just briefly explain what happened and what went wrong. Well, uh, Black Monday was a the biggest percentage, one day percentage fall in US stock history, including the you know, 1929 collapse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was, as they say, a 25 sigma event, which means 25 standard deviations away from the average. Um, and that meant, in practical terms, it plunged 22.6% in a very short period of time, which had a knock-on effect to other global stock markets. So here we are. Um, we're reaching all-time highs, certainly in, in, in the US markets. And there are a lot of parallels mm. In the way that the markets are now operating and, uh, and at these all-time highs, comparatively to 30 years ago. Mm. So, what, what parallels have you, have you yeah. drawn? Well, one is as you as you observe. I mean, valuations are very extended. Um, there is a huge bull run. I'll come back to that in a second on business cycles. But there's a huge bull run. Uh, you've got the the Dow Jones trading at, again near all-time highs, which mm -hmm. it was just prior to Black uh, Monday. UK stock market the same, you've got selected Asian stock markets also doing the same. And um, it tends to promulgate a notion in the minds of certain types of investor, retail investors in particular, that this bull run will never end, mm -hmm. it's happy days as they say in the markets. Um, but uh, they do end, um, the idea that, um, I mean a 22.6% fall in one day is it was unthinkable before it happened mm -hmm. and markets correct all the time there are 10% corrections on markets you know often mm -hmm. um, but the reason why um, we can expect a big one at some point very soon is you say the parallels I mean the economy of the US just take the US for a second is it's showing uncertain growth mm. is anemic Phil, I would say point. anemic is European growth, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, certainly, it's not healthy, it's not yes. robust, let's put it like that, it's an overused phrase nowadays, it's mm. not robust, I mean it's sort of, uh, what is it, well the headline figure I think is about 2.3%, but alongside that you've got inflation, CPI inflation running at 1.7, CPI of course is always understated, mm -hmm. so the real rate of inflation, RPI, and the equivalent is much higher. So if you take the two on real growth, stripping out one from the other, then it's, as you say, it, it is slim. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing and that also that corresponds with the the pattern that established itself just prior to the crash in, in uh, I say crash, it was a crash in, in Black Monday which was I think it was three and a half percent GDP growth in the States against four percent um, CPI inflation. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Uh, the other side of the economic um, argument is that there was at the time, there was much. Uh, the the Dow Jones plummeted um, in the afternoon session in the UK, as it would be. Um, but there had, prior to that, being a huge collapse in the Hong Kong stock market overnight, yes. which a lot of people overlooked. That, in some ways, started the nerves jangling. Mm -hmm. And as you know, when when Asia cracks, <clears throat> you often get a repatriation of funds from other stock markets. So that that in some ways triggered it slightly, but uh, the key factors that um, fueled uh, fear about um, the US economy are also fears about the health of the Asia economy, in particular China. Mm -hmm. And um, now the parallels with that are extensive. I mean China has a debt to GDP ratio, an official debt to, D <laughs> uh, debt -to GDP ratio of well, it's anybody's guess really, but it's officially it's 230% of, of, GD, of GDP, is, so debt is running at twice the rate. But actually that doesn't take into account all the hidden debts in the black 
um, you know, in the the black banking system mm -hmm. and and uh, the wealth management products, WMPs. So actually, the real debt GDP ratio is probably three or four hundred percent. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, uh, that's that's another factor and. Just, I mean, it's mathematically impossible, this notion that China can grow its way out of, uh, of, um, of debt mm -hmm. uh, through economic growth, because it's, it is mathematically impossible. Its debt is growing at twice the rate of its economy. So that's it's simple math. maths. Yeah. It's simple maths. So uh, that's, that's, um, that's another factor, the, the Asian fears. Um, and... Coming back to what I mentioned about the business cycle, there are long-term business cycles, uh, as you know, uh, which last 45 to 60 years, which are, um, they're sort of what you could call the Chondriatiev waves. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they, they are marked by major sea changes in technology. But we're not, this is, this, you could argue that the information technology curve is, is, is moving us into that. Yes. But let's not, Let's forget about that one. The shorter term business cycles, um, as defined by the uh, US National Business Economic Research, NBER, typically last five years, well, three to five years from peak to trough. Um, uh, there have been 34 of them uh, um, since 1857. This is why I get invited to so many dinner parties, <laughs> as, you, as you can gather. <coughs> Um, and this one that we're in now is the third longest in history, well, since 1857, since yes. records began. It's, it's uh, 99 months, just in case you wanted to know. So that, again, portends to the fact, if you take that into, uh, if you take that within the fact as well, the corollary fact that you've got this, as you say, anemic growth, mm -hmm. not just in the US, but in Europe as well. Yes. Japan, as you know, is, <laughs> has always been stifled since the 1980s. Yes. Uh, and so on, um, then there really there's no growth machine. But against that, you have markets going through the roof. Mm -hmm. So we have these, these asset bubbles. And also, we've got to look at um, volatility in mm. markets, certain political uncertainty. Mm. When, you, when you look at uh, back at the, the, the crash 30 years ago, mm. You look at uh, bombing in Iran mm. yes. and, and the, the tip attack that was going on there, and 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 now we move forward thirty mm. years, fast forward thirty mm. years. We've got a North Korea situation. Well, volatility um, it obviously is caused by all sorts of things, um, mainly things that people think again are unlikely. Um, and just, I mean, there is, as you know, as a trader, there's no such thing as the unthinkable. Really, you, exactly. should, you have to think. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. And I mean, coming back to um, the the. The China side of things, mm -hmm. uh, moving on from just the, the debt-to-GDP uh, debt ratio. Um, if you look at, you touched on bubbles earlier, and mm -hmm. bubbles have a tendency to create extensive market volatility yes. in and of themselves. And the housing bubble, as we know, in that case, the subprime housing bubble in the U.S. That was that exacerbated the mm -hmm. the. Uh, the, cra the, the, uh, the, the big financial crisis. I know we're talking about Black Monday, but there's, there's similar parallels. Yes. So at that time, the subprime um, ratio of, uh, of house prices to, to purchase prices mm -hmm. to income in the US was 6.4 times. All right. Mm -hmm. Ten now, years on. It's... No, well, now it's less in the US mm. for various reasons, basically, because people have gone bust, and that's a great <laughs> leveller. But my point is, in China, it's 27 times. Incredible. And in the UK, it's 11 times. Mm -hmm. And if you take as well the other major volatility that uh, fed through into the Asian um, crisis of um, sort of 87 around there, then um, in Japan, at the time of the big credit bubble in the 80s, yeah. when they were just pumping money in to try and resuscitate nominal GDP growth, of which there'd be none for a very long time, that ratio, the housing um, cost to income ratio, that was only eight mm -hmm. times. So you talk about 27 times. In China. And it's, it's incredible um, when you're talking about you know, pumping money into the system. So mm. we've had the best part of 10 years of yeah. all this QE going yeah. in, and at some point that's got to come out. And, and you know, basically. 
gravity, you mm. know, things go up on, mm. on the basis they're supported. If you withdraw that support, then uh, you know, thing, things can fall, and, and that can also be, be an issue. They can, and I mean, I'll sort of answer your questions the, the other way around, mm -hmm. coming back to, um, because what you said is absolutely correct, which brings me on, I will come on to that in a second, but that's how you react um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to crashes. Yes. But uh, the other thing, the geopolitical side of things as well, I'll touch on this very briefly, but um, you had underpinning, uh, added, adding fuel to the fire and to the volatility mix was the fact that you had um, in 1986-87, Saudi Arabia, uh, and this is really, the parallels are astonishing if mm -hmm. you look at them, the, the, uh, Saudi Arabia withdrew effectively from the um, stewardship of OPEC in as much as it used to support yeah. oil prices, which led to a 50% fall in the oil price. And what did we see at the beginning of 2014? But we saw Saudi um, not withdraw so much, but um, force or cajole, persuade, whichever way you want to put it, its neighbours, OPEC members and NOPEC members as mm. well, non-OPEC members, into um, overproducing to lower the oil price in order to price out the US shale industry, which was yes. nascent at the point, yeah. which led to a catastrophic fall from over $105 a barrel um, of WTI to around 30. Yes. So it's exactly the same. And now they're trying to resuscitate, the Saudis are reversed, the Saudis have uh, as much knowledge really as a <laughs> 12 year old studying economics of how markets work, but yes. in my opinion, but so they reversed the decision and now they're, um, they're underproducing now to try and force it up. But of course, the shale industry is more dynamic. They're fitter, leaner. They can break even at $20 a barrel. And they've hedged out all their exposure for about two years. So that's, that's fine. And at the same time, you do as well. You have Donald Trump trying to um, revoke the, uh, the JCPOA, Joint Committee Plan of Action deal, which yeah. is a, a sort of... A, a deal between the, uh, the the key members of the UN the permanent security council members of which there are five uh, the, the usual suspects of so China Russia France the US and the UK plus Germany uh, and he's trying to undermine that so that's ratcheted up pressure with Iran as well yes prior to 1987 there'd been the US firing on Iranian ships Iranians firing on U.S. ships around and about the Strait of Hormuz, which is a key mm -hmm. um, artery for the passage of world oil. Uh, so you've got that as well, and you've got North Korea, just to throw into the mix. Yeah, throw that one in. Just to throw into the mix. So, in terms, so that, so the volatility, volatility has been managed um, simply by dint. Coming back to your original point of mm -hmm. the fact that you have these oceans of money still within the system that, uh, you know, we had rounds and rounds of QE, uh, quantitative easing mm -hmm. from uh, the Fed and indeed, if you remember, from the Bank of England some time ago and mm -hmm. ongoing um, QE in one way or another from the Bank of Japan mm -hmm. and on top of that, um, QE by another name from uh, the European Central Bank. Yes. So you've got walls of money trying to find a home and this really is what is propelling um, the, these these very bullish, almost near vertical mm -hmm. um, rises in world stock markets because it is just QE money, and at some point, sorry, but just round off that point, at some point that money will disappear. Yes, and we're now in a situation where people new to the market mm. are looking to trade. They're saying, well. What, what can go wrong? It just seems to be onwards mm. and upwards. There's money to be made mm. there in them, their markets. Um, be aware. And you, you've, mm. you've recently mm. written a book, uh, which is The Complete Guide to Successful Financial Markets Trading. And it focuses in, in on traders potentially new to the market, I believe, mm. and, and how potentially not to trade, how mm. not to lose money, not necessarily, how, I believe, how to make money, but how not to no, lose it. No, in fact, it. it does both. I mean, it okay. attempts to do both. And uh, it starts, I mean, it's my fifth book, mm -hmm. uh, sort of on a subject which is, you know, how to um, mitigate against risks by retail traders. And uh, um, as many of your viewers will know, 90% of um, retail traders lose all of their money, their investable funds, within the first 90 days of trading. Mm -hmm. 
And so and that's regardless of a, a stock market crash. This that's is irrelevant. Just, yes. that's, that's, even if it's, mm -hmm. if it's bullish as it is now, it's still the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so my books and, and this book as well um, uh, aim to allow um, traders to mitigate risks and to optimize the chances of generating some alpha returns. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it starts out with the basics, hence the, the complete bit, um, which is, you know, things like how to place an order. And I'm talking here about um, uh, on spread betting mm -hmm. sites, because that is the, the main portal through which people will, retail traders will start. But the same applies if you're dealing directly with a broker, if he's doing what you tell him to do, mm -hmm. you know. And it involves, you know, placing stop loss orders. And you would... You, you would not believe, I mean, you're a trader yourself, you must come across people who say, well, I don't bother putting orders on. And you think, well, why? What on earth are you thinking? So, mm. you know, it's how to put stop loss orders on because what a lot of people don't understand is that you can literally, you can cap your losses at whatever, what, whatever level you want. Mm -hmm. um, and it then combines that with on the, on the reward side of things, you really need to, if you take into account technical analysis, you know, you can, there are proponents and detractors from technical analysis, but the one thing it does, which is it shows psychological points at which people either buy more than they sell yes. as a market as a whole or sell more than they buy. So it gives what are called support and resistance levels, support and resistance levels. Um, and you can then, they, they can be used to place orders so that, you know, you can chop out of a, a stop loss order, you can chop out of a, a loss making position. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or to um, to gauge the reward uh, on it, um, and the reward I would say you should not go into a trade unless you stand a, a, a you you stand the likelihood of making four times the amount that you could possibly lose based on I don't know if that's what you think as well yeah, yeah. Yep. so stops uh, and limits exactly right. exactly the same and um, so you know you should place your orders accordingly. And then from there, it builds out once the retail tra or, the, or any trader has, has taken those lessons on board. And it combines things like hedging, and, uh, which can be done cross-asset-wide mm -hmm. and so forth. Then um, what to go for in terms of how you look for market opportunities. And they can be macroeconomic, for example, in, our, uh, in the current scenario, for example. You know, I'm not going to give direct recommendations, obviously, but... One might think that, given the, um, the 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 problems that the oil sector is facing, um, you might be looking at supply cutoffs, mm -hmm. which might force the price higher. Is the way I'm trying to get people to in, who read the book to think, you know? Uh, alternatively, um, you can't. Well, you can. You can sell Chinese banks. Um, directly, but a better way perhaps of doing it given currency considerations, you know, the renminbi is still not fully floating, uh, is to uh, do it via Hong Kong or mm -hmm. proxies or Chinese bank proxies, because then you're taking a, a negative bet on the um, solidity of the Chinese banking system, which is a bit like taking a bet on the solidity of a trifle. If you're short, <laughs> you're probably going to win. Understood. So it's all all in your book, um, it is. which is uh, it's been published, I believe. Now. It is coming out um, on the nineteenth of October, I believe. Oh, the so very it's, apt date. It's very <laughs> very apt date. Uh, um, fantastic, and uh, it's available for, through AD, Amazon, Amazon and uh, Apple, and also on the ADVFN website. Fantastic. So uh, check that out, viewers. But uh, a very interesting. Uh, historical lesson, but also uh, the lots of lessons that we can and viewers and traders can take forward. Um, and hopefully we don't get a crash, but obviously bear that in mind when trading. So stay stay safe if you are trading. And in the meantime, Simon Watkins, thank you very much for joining us okay. here today on Core Finance. Thank you very much. You're welcome.